Mike Matchett with Small World Big Data, and I'm here with some more great Zerto people. I've got Alex Schenk, who's a solutions architect for public cloud, and we're going to talk about some of the best practices and uh, adoption strategies for getting into public cloud in the right way, and how Zerto's going to help enable you to do that properly. Welcome, Alex. Hi, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, you know, we're really talking public clouds, Azure, AWS, and the like, right? Yep, uh, yep exactly. So, what Zerto is uh, able to support as of today is um, you know, vSphere private environments, so okay. typical vSphere clouds, uh, as well as um, IBM Cloud, which is actually a vSphere ba based cloud. Okay. Uh, we also have cloud service providers, but the one that I personally focus on is uh, AWS and Azure. Azure, okay. So the ones most people are familiar with when we say public cloud, but you certainly have a range of things. Correct. And, uh, and I think a lot of what we're going to say even applies if we're talking about private clouds on premise. And uh, a, ab absolutely. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the, the strategy that's involved with on deploying to a public cloud, mm -hmm. you're going to end up translating what you already know on premise into the public cloud. Now granted, there are some very specific things that you have to be aware of. You know, cost control is of course paramount. Okay. Um, but um, you know, a lot of what you already know on premise, know and love within a vSphere environment, you can actually translate into say AWS or Azure. All right, so what's some of your, your top advice tips for somebody thinking about the strategy? They're on premise, they're looking at cloud, they've been told they got to do a cloud journey or migration, maybe they've dabbled with it, so on, but it's not really been a big thing. They may put some storage in there. What, where would you start if you were advising someone? Yeah, so it's it's it first seems like a very big problem, but it really isn't if you cut it up into small chunks. I mean, just like any other mm -hmm. large uh, large endeavor. So the thing about public cloud that I tell my customers all the time is that you have to do your prep work. You have to realize that you're going into the public cloud for a reason. It being just somebody else's computer that, that you can uh, offload work sets onto, um, that usually isn't a good enough reason. Okay. There needs to be something like elasticity that's involved, or there has to be some sort of uh, financial um, modeling that is advantageous to an OpEx model versus a CapEx model. Um, now, I mean, we could certainly talk about things like power and cooling savings and, mm -hmm. and the rent in a, in a rack that you no longer have to pay, but guess what? You still have to pay at some point in the form of, say, compute instances which are running in either EC2 or mm -hmm. Azure is a VM. So um, getting into the cloud for the right reason and, uh, and taking a good hard look at what your underlying goal and strategy is in terms of data um, deliverance is very, very important. Yeah, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who have tried the cloud and failed for various reasons. They've, they've gone there, they've spent way too much money, uh, they've tried to come back, they've had problems on egress, they've uh, found themselves locked into certain kinds of services, yep. or the services weren't there yet, or the, the particular version of the software they wanted wasn't going to run in the cloud yet. Uh, so there is, there's an awful lot of planning that goes on. How does, how does something like Zerto help people approach some of those issues? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the biggest challenges with anything public cloud related is, as you mentioned earlier, egress and that mm -hmm. Hotel California-esque type of, mm -hmm. type of uh, mindset. Um, one problem that um, I encounter all the time is where a customer is overzealous. They put all their eggs into one basket, either in the public cloud platform or really even into a single vendor. Um, and then when it comes time for them to get out because either the relationship soured or there was some sort of um, there was some sort of change in their strategy, they've got to come up with a way to to remove themselves from that problem. Zerto actually provides a a way to extract yourself from that problem. We can get you in and out of any public cloud and any platform really that we support. Um, so using us as a bridge between um, mm -hmm. your current strategy into your new strategy and then for future state is a pretty good way to approach the problem. All right, so it really makes a, make, makes a fluid layer out of where you're going to be able to move your workloads and migrate them. Uh, and we didn't really say the word multi-cloud, but that's inherent in what you're saying is, I, I, or even we, within a cloud, between availability zones, and, and there's this idea of a dynamics and movement that's really required if you're going to uh, really take advantage of the cloud. Yeah, exactly, and um, that, that's, that's one of the very attractive things about something like Zerto, is mm. that um, you know, we don't even, even necessarily need to be stuck in a single vendor, mm. it's a single cloud. We can get you in and out of something like Azure and AWS, if if you uh, if the business dictates that a particular workload 
needs to be located on one platform or the other. Um, we encapsulate that data in such a way that we can move it pretty seamlessly. So um, if anything, what it does is that it, it simplifies your strategy as opposed to having to focus um, you know, o overtly on, on what, the, what the cost of exit would be. Um, now you know that yes, there may be an, a cost in terms of like you know data transfer out of out of a, a cloud, but you have a a migration strategy for your compute resources now. Oh, that's great. Uh, maybe we could take a look at some things. Sure. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, take a look. Absolutely. So really, what we are giving you the ability to do is move a workload from one location to any other location, regardless of what the business okay. requirement happens to be. Okay. So over here under the, these recovery settings, um, so this will be different from uh, platform to platform. For AWS, um, you'll see that we have uh, the ability to select a VPC, a subnet, and a security group. And we can also select the size of our instances that we are failing over into. In this case, my, my default, which happens to be a little bit on the older side, is m3.xlarge. I can select a, um, a different size based upon what the size of my VMs happens to be. So again, this goes back to the preparation stage. Um, figure out what you want these VMs to look like in the cloud. Uh, figure out what, what uh, costs that you're willing to pay for them and then select appropriately. Now, the, the final thing that we have here is our uh, long-term retention policy. As of this recording, we do not yet support uh, writing long-term retention into a ZCA. So we don't, we don't have uh, public cloud targets as a, um, as a supported target for repositories. However, that will be changing. Uh, and there are ways around that as well if you'd like to use the public cloud as a long-term retention target, including the use of a storage gateway or Azure Databox Edge. Um, but for the sake of today, I'm not going to be demonstrating this again because this is not yet a supported feature. And then that's it. So after you go through this, um, this process of selecting your compute, your storage, and your networking requirements uh, for your protected VMs, you click on done and the VPG will be created. So what I'm going to do here by, uh, by clicking on done is I'm instructing Zerto to start moving data. We are going to do an initial sync of that data going up into S3. That is going to create our recovery volumes and we are going to start journaling as well. So you'll see that if you end up going into the S3 bucket that we create upon uh, installation of the Zerto Cloud Appliance, a bunch of little tiny objects. Those little tiny objects will basically be our building blocks for the sake of a failover. Okay, so at this point, what we can do is we can start to do a, uh, an actual failover using an already synced up um, VPG that I have going into AWS. So to demonstrate what this may look like, Notice here that I have my VPG window that lists out a bunch of different you know, virtual protection groups that have already been synced up uh, from one location to another. I also happen to have here um, my vSphere environment that I'm going to be replicating out of and failing out of. I also have my EC2 environment over here. So to do a failover or a move or any other sort of recovery operation, um, I have a couple of different ways I can do this. Um, you'll probably have noticed the test and failover buttons in the bottom left corner. So uh -huh. I could select my virtual protection group for the uh, failover itself and click on say test, or I could click on the live failover. Um, basically they're the same thing, except with a live failover, we give you the ability to do a commit and hand it off to, you know, hand off the failover instance to the underlying hypervisor. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to do a test failover just to show you what it looks like. So we'll pick uh, this VPG over here, which is going into my AWS environment. I will click on next. I will determine the checkpoint that I want to use for the sake of a failover. So very similar to what we would do on premise. 
and that checkpoint goes back into the journal log and we can do something that's really just current all the way back to as deep as your journal, which could be 30 days, right? Correct. So I can go all the way back over here as an example. So you'll see here that I have, you know, June 6, 2019, 10, 07, you know, th and 36 seconds. Mm -hmm. Or I can go to, um, you know, June 6, 2019, 10, 35, 43 seconds, et cetera, et cetera. So if I was to click on refresh here, uh, I'll, it'll show you that we are actually still replicating okay. and still creating checkpoints even as we speak. So I'm just going to pick the, the latest one here, click on OK, click on Next, and then I'll start the failover. And although you call this uh, a, a failover as a test in this DR backup parlance, this is similar to the way you would just even migrate a copy of something or put it in a sandbox for any other use, right? You're just yep. really cloning, you're really cloning this, uh, this virtual protection group at this point. Yeah, that, that's a good way to, to, to think of it. And as a matter of fact, we do have the ability to do an actual, what we call move. I like to think of a move as a zero RPO failover. Um, okay. So the way that a move operation works is similar to a failover in which we are cloning that VM, uh, or in this case, we're creating a new instance. Um, but in this case, what we're doing is we are doing a, um, a, a um, capture mechanism, which gives us, um, you know, no data loss so that we're not reliant upon, say, you know, a five or 10 second, um, you know, your old, or your old, uh, five or 10 second old um, uh, journal file. Okay. So instead, what we're going to do here is if we want to do a proactive move, say that we know a hurricane is coming and it's going to hit our data center, we would go to this actions button over here and click on the move VPG. Okay. Okay. Or if you have a mandate from your, uh, you know, from your CTO saying we're going to move everything into AWS uh, or we're going to move a subset of our uh, workloads in AWS, clicking on this move button is the proactive way to do it. Got it. So at this point, we're, we're starting to spin up our brand new VMs going into EC2. And I'll just demonstrate here, if I click on refresh, you'll see here that we are starting to um, spin up uh, our, um, our test and recovery VM uh, with this tag right over here. Mm -hmm. Currently it's in a stop state. We are starting to do the, um, the orchestration steps that are required in order to rehydrate that data coming out of S3, which is object storage and convert it into block storage and then you know, attach that new volume to our now failed over VM. So Zerto takes care of all this. Um, there's um, stuff that has to happen on the AWS platform itself. Um, you never have to worry about the actual um, steps that are, that are taking place. We automate that entire process. Oh, it's, very, it's, very, it's very cool. It's all wrapped up uh, and you just use the Zerto console. Exactly, exactly. So uh, at this point, I would say let's let, let let's wait for a few minutes here, okay. and it'll spun up. All right, Dave, I'm going to stop the recording for a second. Okay. Okay. So our failover just uh, completed. It took uh, a couple of minutes here, but um, we are ready to actually log into our now spun up um, brand new EC2 instance. So. You'll see here that I have uh, this thing that says JP rel 3 testing recovery. Uh, that is the instance that we had just spun up just a couple of minutes ago. Um, I also have a, a, a private IP address attached to it. So if I was to log in via SSH, and I'll log in as root, Ah, there you are. You can see here that now we've got a functional machine that we can touch, play, interact with um, running in AWS. And so, everything, everything here was of that uh, checkpoint date that we picked back when we did the failover test start, right? So this, yep. is, this is a, this is, if this were a production machine, it'd be a copy of what was at that checkpoint. If we're doing uh, any sort of use case, like uh, some sort of security testing or uh, if, if we want to do uh, application development, uh, scanning, whatever we want, this was basically that machine. Exactly. Uh, for, for all intents and purposes, this is the same exact machine hmm. that is 
or was running in vSphere just a few minutes ago. It still is, right, right? I mean, <laughs> it's okay. Yep, yep exactly. exactly. Cool, cool. So, I mean, and, and for what it's worth, I mean, this could look like a, you know, we're, we're doing a failover right now. Uh, so this is what I'll consider a reactive move. This is something that you do after you have determined that a problem exists. Um, somebody who tripped over a power cable or, um, you know, the, the hurricane already hit your data center. But if we were to do a migration, it would look very, very similar to what you see over here. Um, you're, you're going to have a functional machine that is running in EC2. Uh, you can log into it and do everything that you need to do in order for your business to continue to operate. Um, you know, it just doesn't necessarily need to be done after the fact. It can be done proactively as well. Very cool. And, and just to be clear, now that this is on on. on AWS, if I wanted to, I could take it to another cloud in turn. Yep, exactly. So if I want to migrate now this VM after I do a commit and I do a move, um, what I can do instead is I can create a new VPG. That VPG can exit AWS and go to say Azure or back on premise to vSphere. So right. you're not necessarily tied to this cloud platform uh, if you need to, you know, say, you know, migrate to a different platform altogether. Yeah, I mean, this seems to unlock a whole new world for people on, you know, where they can optimize and run their workloads to get the maximum business benefit. It, it, exactly, exactly. Uh, I, I caution my longtime customers who, you know, who have been with us for many years and know us as a really, really solid DR product. And, that, and while that's true, uh, that we are a very good, um, um, you know, platform that, you know, can do disaster recovery uh, very well. It's not the only thing that we do. I mean, it, as a matter of fact, I would say that this ability to migrate workloads into and out of a cloud platform is just as important, if not more so from a strategic perspective than just, you know, simple DR. Awesome. Well, thanks for showing this to me today, Alex. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Once you see that you can get a workload from one cloud to another or in and out of something like Azure, uh, you feel much better about using it. And um, it looks like you can almost sort of gain experience now by uh, doing it rather than failing at it. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a good way to put it. So um, don't get me wrong. I mean, we, yeah. uh, w there is still going to be some work that is going to be involved in terms of you know, your, your cloud transformation journey. Uh, what, what we do is we try to alleviate most of that pain by giving you a way to seamlessly spin up resources in that cloud based upon what you already have on an original location such as vSphere or you know, say a different okay. platform. Yeah. So, so both the planning uh, and the execution uh, become a push button. Correct. Right? Um, and uh, what, tell me a little bit about automation, if I want to start you know, making my, my cloud journey automatic and do something. Yeah, so, so great question, especially considering that a big um, component about cloud is an automatic uh, spin up or... I want or, to provision something on demand, I want yeah. to get, I want to burst, I want to... Of, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, so all that is very important, and um, you know, Zerto has uh, a RESTful API which you can leverage. Uh, we also have PowerShell commandlets uh, that, that you can use as well, uh, but uh, the idea here is that you don't want to have to do all this work uh, on demand reactively all the time. So what we want to do is we want to provide you with a, a mechanism that will, um, that will be programmatically enabled. So that way, should certain business logic be hit, uh, you'll be able to say move workloads or do a recovery or say recover a file on on demand as opposed to say you know having to go into a GUI and push a button. Yeah, oh that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for being here today, Alex. Thank you. Uh, we're going to cover some more things with Zerto, but that was awesome. Uh, we'll be right back. Take care, guys. <laughs>